This module is on the application memory footprint, how the application uses memory and profiling application memory use. The advanced sys admin class that follows this then gets into how the operating system manages that memory and things like trimming and swapping and things of that sort. We're going to introduce some of that in this module, but the uh, virtual memory module of the advanced sys admin class gets into how KSwap D manages memory and the memory map itself. So one of the key things to understand here is demand paging. Demand paging basically says I'm not going to worry or deal about the page until I actually use it. We have two phases here, a reservation and then an allocation. We can reserve a lot of memory and then never use it, so why allocate or waste that memory? We also want to talk about what makes up a process, the four basic segments or three basic segments, the task, the data, I'm sorry, the text, the data, and the stack. Explain what the binary format is, ELF. And one of the key things here and in lab is TLB misses. There is a program example, matrix A, matrix B, that you run in lab. This is a rows versus columns stride one example, and you can look with the hardware counters at the TLB miss differences. We also want to look at how the memory is placed in the NUMA topology. There's DLOOK, but again, I use a script called DLOOK summary that will consolidate that DLOOK report and tell me how many pages are on each node. A little bit brief coverage about fork versus clone, and there is a lab exercise where you run this uh, copy and write program that stops at different phases of the program to allow you to see before the fork and after the fork, before the allocation and after the allocation, what the memory footprint looks like. And we also want to get into the malloc S break and map calls and how that grows a process. And then I do want to do a little bit of demo in this area and try to hit the out of memory killer and try to hit the uh, uh, malloc stalls and get high system time all from memory allocations. Now I do not intend to do a demo right now of huge pages or super pages. Now super pages are being used by the latest SGI MPT. I think you mentioned that you were going to use it at your site, so yeah. we can work on the lab, but I just wasn't going to demo that right now. But there is a written lab, and you can take Floyd 1 and get super pages in place, and then try running an MPI, MPT application that will use super pages. Super pages are actually allocated out of the BIOS. And if I have a 16 terabyte machine, I or allocate a terabyte, in the super pages, that terabyte will not show up in mem info. It is not known to the operating system. It is looked at as BIOS. So if I carve out a terabyte for super pages, it will not show up in mem used, mem free, mem available. Topology and everything will not report that t missing terabyte memory because it's in the BIOS. All these systems are paging-based machines nowadays. And this is where you get into numerical problems and issues. In reality, they are powers of two, 1024 bytes, or one meg, or one gig, are two to the 10th, two to the 20th, or two to the 30th. And I should probably fix this up, because nowadays we use an up arrow, or actually a KIB, to indicate that it is the power of two number versus a power of ten number. Now everything is a page-based machine nowadays, TOB misses, virtual to physical type of concept. The size of your page table can be gotten with the get comp command page size. And the default page size here is 4K byte. When we were on Itanium, they were at 16K byte for a while, and then they went up to 64K byte. That's intended to reduce TLB misses. But if I'm doing lots of little processes, I don't want to waste 64K byte for a 1K binary, for example. The total number of pages on the system would be the memory size divided by the page size. 
So I took an example here where I had a 64 gig machine and a 4K byte page size. So four times two to the 10th and a gig was two to the 30th in floating point or, or in uh, floating point arithmetic like this, you divide the four into the 64 giving me 16 and you subtract the 10 from the 30 to give me two to the 20th, which gave me 16 million 4K byte pages. When we reference memory, we basically get a page number and a byte offset on the page. Now, if I have a lot of 4K byte pages, that could introduce lots of TOB misses, and that's why we go to things like huge pages and super pages. But I'd rather take care of the stride pattern first and worry about a stride in one pattern and worry about my rows versus columns, Fortran versus C, and get a stride one such that when I load a cache line, I walk through all the objects or elements on that cache line and not just do one and then hit to the next cache line. TLB misses will also result in cache misses. So we want to reduce both of those in our tuning. That's a single threaded situation, but it's going to be expensive when you're multi-threaded as well. Every process has at least three segments. We call that the text segment. That's your executable, your binary, shared text. I only have one bash in memory. Now this is where I can get into contention problems. If I am in a, a dirty write memory situation and all my memory is dirty, my interconnect can get busy as that dirty data is being flushed off to disk. And then when I try to run a command, I may have to go across the interconnect to find that share text on another node. Now, dplace does have the ability to replicate that share text so I do not have to go across the interconnect. And I cannot modify a share text. They are read only. The way you modify the share text area is through an exec to execute a new binary. The second portion of a process is the data segment. That's what is unique by every process. When we get into threads created by clone, they do share the data segment. But in general, it is private. This is why you have uh, inter-process communication shamam or dev shamam to communicate between processes. And the data segment is read-writable by the process. The data segment includes an initialized static portion of the data segment, and then there is also a dynamically changing portion of the data segment called the heap, and when you do malix, the reservation of the heap grows, and then when you actually allocate that memory, the data segment's reservation goes to an allocation, and then you actually get a RSS or a physical portion of memory allocated for the data segment. So the data segment is primarily the heap that can grow and shrink. Rarely do we actually shrink the data segment. We'll talk a little bit about this, but when I do a malloc, I grow the reservation for the heap, then I can allocate it. If I do a free, that will reset my pointer in the heap to reuse my allocated memory but it will not release the allocated memory. A free simply frees up the reservation portion and allows me to reallocate or reuse prior allocated memory. DLOOK again is able to tell all of this. The third portion of the process is the stack segment. This is for subroutine call sequences. The GDB command, backtrace command, will print out the stack. And by the way, nowadays we can have automatic arrays that are also placed on the stack. So the stack is private to the process. When we are doing clones and pthreads and OpenMP, they do share the stack, and you will see the stack grow when you are multi-threading. In fact, there is a limit to the stack, and people have to use the limit or U limit to increase the stack size when they start going larger threads to avoid segmentation faults. The stack is read-write, but basically when I jump from a subroutine 
to another subroutine, the prior subroutine's local environment is written and pushed onto the stack. Then when I exit or return out of that subroutine I jumped to, I pop off the stack the prior subroutine to return to the instruction pointer and the local variables that that prior subroutine had. Again, GDB is the main thing printing out the stack. Now we can also have two other types of segments attached to a process, memory map segments, which does include the XP mem stuff, and shared memory, which includes the IPCS shemem type of stuff. Looking at a binary, when we look at the binary, we can see an ELF header, a program header, and then we've got sections. There's a command called nm that will print out these different sections. And then when we look at it running, we still have an ELF header and a program table, but we have segments. The text segment, the data segment, the stack segment. There is a read ELF command that can tell you about the binary. In particular, in this case, I see my binary is still an titanium system instead of a uh, x86, 64-bit Intel, or 32-bit binary, for example. It also tells me the start of the different program headers, size of the headers, things of that sort. Then I can use the size command to tell me how big, without running, how big the text, the data, the BSS is part of the heap, the blank storage space. This is uh, where we can allocate arrays and things of that sort. And then we can see it in decimal and hex. And if you do a size dash A, then you can see each of the individual sections and how big they are. For example, I see the shared text portion of the segment here. And here is the blank storage space where the heap will grow and shrink out of that particular area. But this is just on the executable to break out how big the pieces of the executable are. Also see some read-only data area, things of that sort. We can also run an NM command on a binary. And in there, we can get different types, basically printing out the symbol table information. So we can find out from an address where we are in the program, if it is a subroutine name or a structure or things of that sort. So demand paging. A malloc results in a virtual memory reservation. So when I ask for memory, I may do a malloc that results in a reservation on the heap. Now malloc is going to go and fall to a system call named sbreak. Sbreak will go to the page table and look for the address. And if the address doesn't exist, for example, it's malloking. And then when we touch it, we're going to get an address back of where the actual physical address is. But when I first do a malloc, it is a virtual address that may not exist yet. The malloc is going to be a growth in the process heap that's in the data segment. Now, this is the thing. Mallocs are generally always successful. There's no error status returned on a malloc. We are over-reserving memory. There is an overcommit capability, and overcommit zero says I can oversubscribe, over-reserve my memory. And that's what was known as the commit. Also, a program could get an invalid address from the malloc, try to reference it, and get a segmentation fault because the address does not exist, because maybe we are in a out-of-memory situation, and a segmentation fault could occur. So the malloc is a reservation. Then when I actually try to allocate the memory by touching it, if I try to read a shared text, it's going to allocate memory and read it in from the file system. Or if I start writing my data or initializing and zeroing out array, that will result in memory allocation. Now there is a lab exercise where you try a copy and write where a parent forks a child and then it pauses at different points in the process. When we do the fork, the child has the pointers to the parent. That way the child, if the parent is a gig in size, the child does not need a gig in memory. 
this defers memory use until we actually need it, and we need it when we actually do an allocation. So when the child actually starts writing, that's going to result in the uh, kernel allocating a new page for the child. So we don't actually need the full memory for the child to get through the fork. If no physical memories are left, then we're going to push old pages to swap. The key thing here now, when an application runs and tries to get to a virtual address, the virtual address is mapped to a physical location using the page table and a TLB buffer that's on the chip, what's called the MMU, or Memory Management Unit. So when the program counter tries to go to an address, if it doesn't find it on chip, if the TLB buffer does map, not map it to a physical location, that results in a TLB miss to the kernel, also called an exception. The kernel will then go to the page table to find out where that uh, address is. If it isn't executable, it will get it from the file system. If it's in memory, it will simply return the memory address. Otherwise, it could find the page out on swap and will initiate I.O. and then return the address of it. Now, when we are bringing pages in from swap, that is known as a major page fault. And in top, end faults are pages swapped into memory. Now, it is possible for end fault to have values to it, even though you haven't done any swapping, because you are reading things in from the file system for the executable. So let's just say I've got zero swap. My program runs, uh, and it finds uh, A dot out in memory. Then I run out of physical memory, and there's no swap configured. But when I run out of physical memory, K swap D comes in and starts trimming the slab first and pushes that down as far as it can. Then it starts trimming the page cache and trims that down as far as it can, which includes shared text. So then the next time I need A dot out, it got thrown away during a trim. And again, SAR dash big B shows me trims. So the next time I need it, it's out on slash bin, and now I've got to take a page fault or an end fault to read that executable back into memory. So you can have major page faults without any swap device I.O. going on because you're going to the file system, not to swap. Any questions on this slide? Okay. Now, there is something in the advanced as admin class that deals with overcommitting memory, which impacts how memory shortage problems are handled. The default is a zero which means malloc will ignore any error at an S break. We will allocate all of my memory. We can reserve all of my memory and more, but once we've allocated all my memory, processes eventually get killed by the out of memory killer, or the system can even go idle. I can set it to a one. If you're familiar with IRIX, a lot of our customers that I've dealt with want it to behave like an IRIX where they want the malloc or the reservation to fail if there's no memory available. And that would be an overcommit to a two, which means I cannot over-reserve my memory. And I need to demo this a little bit, particularly in the advanced as admin class, there's a ratio. We are not allowed to exceed swap plus physical memory times the ratio. There is an overcommit three, total address space allocation is not permitted to exceed the swap itself. I should double check to make sure that's still there. Now the best way to handle this, in my opinion, is a zero. If I set it to a two, the problem is I could come in, reserve 16 terabyte of memory, use one terabyte, and now nobody else can use the other 15 terabyte of memory and their mallets will fail. Particularly in a OpenMP or MPI situation, Every thread has to reserve memory for every other thread. This is where we get into a problem of threads sharing memory and not correctly accounting for memory. So we have something called MEMAC, which I'm sure you're running. MEMAC-D is something that is used by PBS Pro to say how much really is the memory being used and not count the shared 
space. So if I had 10 threads sharing a terabyte of memory, the reservation would look like 10 gig, not 1 gig. But the allocation would only be 1 gig which means nobody else can use the other 9 gig because I've reserved it, even though I'm not actually going to use it. So by having your overcommit added to and the MemacD running, MemacD will say, I don't really count that shared space. I'm not going to count it as 10 gig. I'm going to count it as 1 gig. And then you are able to use the other memory for other jobs. So demand paging, our process is full of pages, what's called a virtual page number, VPN. I got a text, a data, and a stack. And then in the kernel, and ProcMemInfo shows how big it is, there is a per process page table. This is what TOB buffers are loaded from. The page table describes the virtual page number and the physical location and memory. These are known as anon pages within MemInfo. And the rest of the pages for this process are still invalid, meaning that there is no virtu there's no physical address for them yet. So that physical page is going to point to where in physical memory it is. And by the way, part of our physical page number, the upper bit includes the node address space ID or NAS ID, so that we know which particular node or blade is responsible for that memory address range. The TOB buffer is something on the chip. Translation look aside buffer. We are translating a virtual address to a physical address and looking aside or next to the virtual address to get the physical mapping. The physical portion of the TOB was determined by the kernel when the page was allocated. So if I take a TOB miss, or actually if I take an address, and address it, and I can't find it in the TLB buffer, that is known as a TLB miss. Since I can't find it on chip in the buffer, I then take an exception to the kernel, which is also referred to as a hot path through the kernel. By the way, any process taking a TLB miss will not lose the CPU from the TLB miss. It's not a voluntary context switch. We don't want to load the TLB buffer on chip and then get disconnected and load and thrash on TLB misses. So I take a TLB miss to the kernel. The kernel goes to the page table and says, oh, this page is in memory and returns a physical address. Or it says the page is not in memory, let's allocate it. Or it says the page was allocated, it exists, but now it's out on swap. So let's allocate a page in memory and initiate the I.O. and then put that address back into the TLB buffer. Let me go to a uh, whiteboard. So when I take a TLB miss, can't find the virtual to physical on chip. It's also known as a minor page fault. So kernel looks at page table for that virtual address. Does not exist, it will allocate and return address to the TOB buffer. It exists in page cache, return the address. That does not require as much work. I don't have to allocate and spin on an allocation lock on a per node basis. Or if it's text, it will allocate in page cache. read in from slash bin file system, for example, and return 
the address. By the way, allocation up here was the data segment, or was known as a non-pages, versus something that's in the page cache or shared text. Or it could be swapped, so we allocate or determine where in memory start swap in and return the address. These are not counted very well in uh, Linux. Iris did a good job. But there is a slash proc slash VM stat. I think it's VM stats. Hang on a second. Double check it. Oops. No, it's VM stat. There's a VM stat file that contains information on this activity and SAR big B shows some trim information. You can find allocations and deallocations, uh, allocation stalls, things of that sort in the PROC VM stat file. And PCP can get to all of them. The swap ones are known as a major page fault. Or also N faults in top. And if I have a text, if I read a text file in from swap, I mean from slash bin, that will also get counted as a major page fault, reading in the shared text from the file system. DOB misses are expensive. Now the UV project has the hub and the hub has support to cache the TOB information, and also to synchronize. It's possible that a page gets swapped out, and then when it's read back in, the address of that page has changed. And basically, you've got to make sure that all the TOB buffers on all the cores are also coherent to a TOB address change. And you get what's called lazy TOB shootdowns. And there are interrupts for this stuff in slash proc slash interrupts. So the hub has hardware support to reduce the need to keep going back to the kernel to get page table information. And there's something in the hub called a broadcast accelerator unit that helps keep all the TLB pages, all the TLB buffers coherent across the system. Any questions on this? No. Let me go back. So TLB buffer is a space on the chip, usually like 128, and you might have different TLB buffers for each of the caches, L1, L2, L3, may have different TLB buffers depending upon the core you're working with. And the TLB buffer is mapping by virtual to physical. If I don't find it on chip, I take an exception to the kernel and go to the page table to find out what to do. And by the way, reading a page in from swap is counted with get delays. And you can see how long time you're waiting for a page to come in from swap. This is just trying to show that when I fork a process, there is a lab exercise, a copy and write command that you will run. When the parent forks off a child, the child is going to have pointers pointing to the parent. This saves memory, and if the child doesn't need anything, then why fork it off? And by the way, PBS mom does a fork but never does an exec. So the fork child says, am I the parent or the child, and does different logic, but then there's never a change 
could never exec some new program on top of itself. So it's sharing the address space with the parent. Then when the child actually addresses something that the parent is read only, then uh, and it tries to write it, then the child is going to get a new allocation. Copy and write in the labs will demonstrate that. <laughs> exec. When I fork off a process, the first thing I do after it typically is an exec. And we're just trying to show here that the child has everything the parent has. Any file that was open in the parent, the child has open, including standard in, standard out, standard error. So on a copy on write, as soon as the child forks off, its pointers are to the parent. But then when it does try to write to the data segment, it's going to get its own data in its own stack but it might still be sharing the same text. And here we're just trying to show shared text where we've got two different processes that have two different data segments and stack segments, but they're still using shared memory and still have a shared text. Now this is with a fork. When I do a clone, the child can, on a clone, share the data segments as well. Cloned processes have a shared data segment, memory space. Now when a program starts needing memory, there is dynamic memory allocation. Basically the, the memory allocation is called the heap, which is in the BSS space. When I do a malloc, I get a reservation, but then when I actually zero out the array, that reservation is going to turn into an allocation and the heap is going to grow. Uh, some of this stuff is old. Don't worry about this stuff. The U area is gone nowadays, and it's a paging machine, but we still try to do our allocations contiguously to avoid fragmentation. So there's something called buddy info, slash proc slash buddy info tells you uh, how contiguous the pages are. But don't worry about this stuff. When we fork off our child, the, the child cannot write to the shared text. And the parent cannot, they're sharing, they're not sharing stacks or anything because it was a fork. Also something called block storage. The program may not use all of the storage reserved in its BSS space. Real old programs used to be called over-indexing blank common. Basically they'd have a big BSS space and then address into it. Programs like that should be rewritten. These are for programs I call a sparse matrix solver. They use only a small portion of the large array, and they might be randomly addressing a gather, scatter, or record referencing within that array. In that case, TLB misses are going to be random and wild all over the place. Again, growing the BSS space with a heap, the reservation is made from virtual memory, but it's never allocated if it never zeroes it out or is never referenced. Clearing it, a calic or something like that will clear the malloc space and change it from a reservation to an allocation, but that allocation might not be node aware. It might be not be NUMA aware. You want to make sure that when you allocate it, the thread that uses it is on that CPU, on that socket. One of the problems, you can reserve all the memory and never use it. It'd be sloppy in your memory use. That's why we do the overcommit equals two. You'd also like to know about your stride pattern so that I get a stride one pattern and reduce my TLB misses. Or you might have a random gather scatter. There was a nice thing in IRIS called GMEM usage that would actually show my allocations and my strides later so I could actually see how it was striding and where the nodes were and stuff. Then we have the stack. The stack is the portion of the program used by the operating system to jump and return from subroutines. So every time I jump, I push onto the stack the current subroutine. I get my local variables. I get a link back to the – oh, I'm down here, sorry. So I'm starting off in main. I'm going to get the program counter, the return address, arguments passed into it, and – local variables to that subroutine. Then when main calls a function, 
everything is pushed onto the stack here, and we now have a new stack for the second subroutine. And then when I am done and return or exit out of that function, I can return back to my prior subroutine. Debuggers like GDB basically look at the user stack information. There's also a kernel stack used for subroutine jumping in the kernel, and perf top can look at that stack, as well as the uh, echo T in the proc sysrq trigger or KDB or crash can also look at the kernel stack and arguments that are on the kernel stack. Uh, let's see, I don't really care about this. We just have something called the user area. There is a portion of the process that is in kernel space, not addressable by the user program. Some of these slides are real old and I need to throw them away. And then we have the kernel stack trace and again, uh, crash, K KDB with an arch KDB or a BT or the echo of a T into slash proc slash sys arc Q dash trigger or perf record dash G for a butterfly. All stack report. These are all things that basically are looking at the kernel stack information. When you're multi-threaded, multiple threads are sharing the same shared text. And again, they all need to go across the interconnect to get to that shared text. If the interconnect gets busy, it's going to be hard to get to that executable if it doesn't stay on chip. In the data L1, I'm sorry, the instruction L1 cache. And each of the threads have a portion of the stack segment associated to them but they are able to share their stack segments. For example, they might have automatic arrays that are in that stack. To save memory these days, or save memory in the old days, there was what's called DSOs, Dynamically Linked Shared Libraries. And basically, the A dot out, you would prefer to have these dynamically linked. By the way, if you go static, things like PS run, and other commands cannot profile a statically linked binary because they can't drop in a, a, a library called interception or trojan that can do the instrumentation. So in here, all these different library functions are a DSO. Using LDD on it, you can see what DSO is going to run when it initiates, depending upon that current path. And PMAP will show for the current running, because I don't have it here yet. But PMAP shows libraries linked or being used by a process, by a running process. So I had a case where I go to the site, 50% system time, saw that it was barrier synchronization, sked yields, context switching going crazy, found the process doing all the high system time, and then with PMAP saw that it had linked in an OpenMP library, and it was an MPI application. So PMAP can show you what library you're linking in, tell you whether you're using an Intel library or a uh, in, uh, SGI library, things of that sort. Particularly when you're mixing MPTs with MPI, LDD can come in handy. So LDD is on the executable using your path. Now here's an example of a program is trying to malloc memory, and every time you do a system call, it's going to return back to here something called P error. And P error will say, if that system call errored, write this message. It will also write out a P error message. So in this example, I ran a program code for, it's big in memory, and it got killed by the kernel with a 15 being terminated, which is a SIG term. But 
that program could have also done a segmentation fault instead of a kill by the colonel. I then echoed a two and over memory and ran it, and then it said malic error cannot allocate memory. It could never even run. Now I want to try and share my desktop here real quick. You do a man on Malik, man two for system. Well, let's just do a man Malik. I don't think it's a two, it's a three. Let's do the three. So when I do a Malik or a Calic, I'm basically saying here's what I need. And again, a free does not free up memory, it just resets the pointer in my heap back onto allocated memory that I allocated and used, but when I did a free, I don't give that memory back. I just move my pointer back. That way we don't get in a thrashing where I allocate, deallocate, allocate, deallocate every time I do a malloc and a free. And I was, so the return value is a pointer in the memory, hopefully aligned. On error, these functions might return a null. A null may also be returned by a successful malloc with a size of zero. So normally malloc allocates from the heap, but just the size of the heap is required using the S-break system call. A malloc results in an S-break. And there are limits to that with the limit command. But what's interesting here now is bugs. By default, Linux thinks optimistically that memory will be, a, will be available. When malloc returns a non-null, that's an address, there's no key guarantee that the memory is real available. In case it turns out the system is out of memory, a process will get killed by the out of memory killer, the OOM. And you can turn that off by echoing a two into there, but then you end up with other types of problems such as malloc failures. And frankly, uh, Linux is not tested very well in an overcommit to environment. So you can get into trouble doing that. Instead, also by the way, if I go to overcommit memory, if I reserve 16 terabyte and only use a terabyte, the other 15 terabyte are not usable by anyone else. So what some sites do, instead of avoiding the, the wild killing by the kernel, they have a daemon that runs to catch the swapping and to kill the process that's creating the out-of-memory event before you hit the out-of-memory event and before the kernel has to start killing. Now there is a command called memhog. I'm just going to go one gig. While this is happening, let me see if I can get something working here. Go to DMZ server, login as guest, password as guest. Also wanted to uh, run a PM chart dash H on Floyd. I was on flight two, I believe. Yep. I'm going to go in as root. Oh, wait a second. I'm using PM chart. I don't have to log in. Let's see if I got any of my predefined views. I do have an all. Let me do the all tab, which will give me everything. I don't care about those. My NumaLink ports are different on this particular node, so I'm going to just ignore that and know that the NumaLink tab is no good. This NL tab is no good. Again, that's not even turned on. If I want to turn that on, a LinkSat-UV, capital A. That's okay. So looking at the system, idle CPU, 
Looks like there might be a little bit out on swap. Let me get rid of free. I do have some stuff out on swap already. My memory looks like it's all slab. And then I've got disk I.O. with reads going on. Let me blow up memory in more detail now. There's my page tables we were talking about. Dirty, NFS unstable, and right back. Raw I.O. with buff mem. The kernel slab. Cash clean, which is derived by PCP. And the Anon pages is my process space. Oh, I want to uh, change my number of samples here. Go larger. Uh, let me go back to this other window. So I'm going to fire this thing off at 100 gig. And I'm going to get rid of standard error so that I don't have to see the output message. Put it in the background. Bring up top. I do have a fine running. What happened here? Memhog didn't work. Can't allocate memory. Ooh, problem here. Let's see what's going on. First of all, let me do a uh, more on slash proc slash mem info. Oops. I do all, uh, I have 56, 57 gig that's free, but I have a slab that's 23 gig. My total system is 132 gig. Plus, I have a swap. Let's see, swap is 10 gig. I have virtual memory, basically, of 142 gig. Virtual memory is physical memory plus physical swap. So I've got about 140 gig available on this system. Now, let's just see how much I can actually. Let me go 90 gig. Oops. Can't allocate that. 80 gig. And I can't get 80 gig out of there. What was reclaimable? Let me break out of there for a minute. So I had only three gig that was not reclaimable. So even though I have a 140 gig that should be usable, I could only get 80 gig running. Okay, let me run this again now. That thing's running. And notice the process growing. I'm seeing some here, which is blue. Click on that, and I'm seeing Anon pages growing. Now, let me see what's going on. Oops. Let me do this again. Put it in the background. Bring it up top. There's my memhog running. Here's why my slab is big. I still have a find. Notice the memhog is 98% system or CPU utilization. Uh, I should. I asked for 80 gig. I have allocated a reserved 8 gig at this point. And there's something that I need to talk about here. Swap. I put in a swap field here. Swap is really just virtual minus physical. So if I take that 80 gig and subtract the 8 gig, that's where I get now, in this case, 65 gig is left. And I do have a little bit of system time going on with this. Let me do a top sys. And memhog is kind of high on the list. Notice those migration threads, too. Not seeing a whole lot. These are since process started, not during the recent sample interval. This thing is basically 70% in the kernel with system time. Let me try a perf. What's the PID first? Perf top dash P on 2227. And I've seen it initialized.
specialize. All it's doing is clearing out the array. So this is the uh, glibc doing the zeroing. Here's the kernel clearing that page and zeroing it out. Okay. Now let me do an S trace on that thing. All it's doing is writing a, a dot out to standard out. If I do a memhog, uh, one gig, for example, oops. All it's doing is that. I want to show you something here now. I'm going to do an S trace memhog, one gig. And let me break out. I could have saved that into a file. Let me do that again and save that into a file. Dash O X. Now let me look at that file X. So here's where it's actually execing memhog, doing some memory mapping, and then looking for all the libraries and doing a little bit of growth here, checking its, its proc self status. and going through and mapping some information into the process on a per node basis. Looks like it did an LS or a get D ints to find itself, close things off. Here's where it actually set its affinity. And then Right here is where it did its memory mapping. It is not doing a malloc. Memhog is doing an M map. Let me try this again. Let me go 100 gig again. Oops, can't go that big again. Can't go that big. Let's just go 70 gig. Oops. Can't even get to 70 gig. Let's go 20 gig. You can get to that. Let me take a look at X. And here's the mem map where it's asking for the 20 gig that I just asked for. So memhawk is using an M map, not a malloc. I want to go into home. Yes. Uh, say labs, code examples. You're going to be running this program matrix A and matrix B. And copy on write is another one to play with in the lab. And I was looking for, uh, I don't see the program I wanted. Let me go into a different directory. I'm looking for code four. Here's my code four dot C. Let me do a more on code four dot C. This used to be known as thrash on IRIX. meant to thrash TLBs. And basically here is trying to build a tree based upon a count that was passed in and then initialize it. And when I go down to build tree, here's the allocation. And if P error fails, it's going to come back with this if the system call fails. And what am I passing in for arguments? Passing in, I've got arguments here, dash N for number of loops, dash M for memory usage. So let me try a GCC on that code 4.C. Uh, warnings only, I'm not too worried about that right now. Let me just see if I can run this. One of the problems is, uh, 
it's doing a uh, random number generator differently between GCC and Intel. Let A.out is running. See if we can catch it here. Let me get Anon's out. There's my Anon pages running. I'm going to do an S trace dash X on dot slash A dot out. I'm going to put it in the background here. And look, it is doing nothing but breaks instead of that single M map. So this is a malloc rather than an M map. So let's see if I can do a dot slash a dot out. And let's try a really big number here. Didn't seem to bother by that. I don't think it's working right. I've got a newer version that allows me to grow bigger. Let me fire off a couple of these now. See what they're doing. I bring in top. I can see them running. They're asking for about two gig, and right now they're reserving about 106 or allocated about 162 meg. A little bit of system time, not too bad here. Notice the difference between virtual and resident is 1.4 gig. And they are consuming CPU time and running right now. Uh, I want to do something here. Swap off dash A. Anything that was out on swap will get brought back into memory. I'm trying to push it to an out of memory killer situation. Let's see what uh, PM chart is showing me. Looks like I might be dropping data at this point. I can see where the CPU utilization got high, a little bit of system time in there. I can actually see where I dropped my swap now but there's still stuff out on swap. And look at it, it's bringing the swap into memory. Just waiting for that swap to be completely gone. Let me take a look at my memory section here. Get rid of free. Starting to get some of them coming back. Now, there is one other thing I'm going to do here. You Shamem, I got this code 903, and it's also using memory, but it's, it's creating a shared memory segment. Looks like they have finished. I just want to do a uh, IPCS-AM. And I do have some things in here. Look like two gig in size that still have unattached shared memory. So what do we got there? 20 gig. So all these are unattached shared memory segments. If I do an LS on slash, I'm sorry, let me do a more on slash proc slash mem info. Oh, I got other things uh, finishing up right now, or I did an accidental paste. But notice I have quite a bit of shared memory that's unattached, almost 50 gig right now. 
and I'm starting to run out of memory. My swap is full. Let's see what the uh, – so here was the event that occurred. Notice my cash clean went up during that and also my mapped. What I'm trying to show here is that cash clean and mapped is the shemem. Let me do another thing here. Uh, add a tab. Let's just call it Shemem. And plot it. Get to a uh, Mem Util Shemem. I'm going to change it to a stack bar. and then add it to my drawing, my chart. There's my Shemem. So let me do this use Shemem again. Notice I am getting a cannot allocate memory message because I'm out of Shemem capability here. go back to mem here. So all that shemem that I just fired off is being counted as both cached and mapped. Now let me go back and kill all those things. Let me first of all bring up top so I can see those code nines running. They're showing a reservation about 17 gig in most cases, and using the 17 gig is reserved. But they're sharing the same memory address. So no swap configured. Most of my memory is still free. I'm only using 57 gig. The rest is empty. I have a 58 gig that's in cache. I'm going to kill all those code 903s, IPCS-AM first. Oh, and I can see I am running into some problems here. So do a kill all code 903, which will result in a memory leak, essentially. And if I go back to my memory map here and look at mem, by killing them, all the mapped space went away. Mapped is Shemem that is actively attached to. But because I killed them without removing the shared memory segments, my cache field is still showing all that Shemem unattached shared memory space. And I can go to the Shemem field here and see that I got 54 gig of Shemem. Kind of done with this demo portion. Let me get back to the slides. Was there any particular question you had before I... Go back to the slides. No. Uh, topology. So I've got a 128 gig or yeah, 128 gig machine. I was trying to hit ohm. So let me do a mem hog. 20 gig. There, we did get something killed. Trying to stack up all my CPUs. Bring up top. There's all the memhawks. Look at how the migration threads are going nuts because these are running wide open. My system time is now 99%. Let me quit.
bit out of here. I am now in a bad situation. Again, I got no swap to make it easier to hit the out of memory killer. Let me do a tail on D message. So D message tail. Ah, uh, come on. I am starting to see out of memory killer events occur. This tail slash var log messages. Hope that syslog itself hasn't been killed. Having trouble getting responses out of the system right now. And I can see some boom events are occurring. Let me go back to my PCP here. So since that event, when I bomb these off, there's my system time going nuts. I'm going to pull that apart a little bit more. There's my memory, and I have cache clean, which is all that shamem. And then I ran this uh, memhog, which is all the blue or non-pages. And then I'm basically hitting an out-of-memory killer situation there. Now, let me go back here. If I go into top, there's all my mem hogs running. I am 99% system time right now. Let me do a perf top. And there's that spin lock that I was talking about. So here I can see that these are all trying to allocate. So I've got this raw spin lock IRQ. And all my system time is on that raw spin lock IRQ. So reading, I can see some things in here for uh, clearing out the pages, TLB handling, copy a page, stuff like that, CPU scheduler. But all my system time is this raw spin lock IRQ, and somebody might think that this is due to a trim situation, depending upon what they see in here. So I want to do, first of all, a uh, PS-E. Let's just pick one of these things. S-Trace-P on 2934. Can't see it in a system call. It does not appear to be doing any sort of system call. I'm going to do a perf top-P. Look at just one of them. Two nine three four. So we're pulling apart that system time. I'm not seeing any system time on that process right now. Let me try a different one. Uh, perf top dash p on two nine one one. I'm just picking one. And there I can see for that process, it's all system time, all in this raw spin lock IRQ. Trying to allocate something here. Let's see. Now I'm going to try a perf report, record here. Dash G on that particular process. Uh, there's no option on PERF to say how long you want to do your sample, so I'm just letting it sit for a few minutes. Good enough. So now let me do a PERF report on that data. PERF.data was the default. I got a, a thousand samples of it. And there's that raw spin lock IRQ. Isolate free pages and raw spin lock IRQ save. So that raw spin lock IRQ is the top of the list. Now notice there's a plus sign in there. So do a plus. Let's see if we can do this here. Let me try it. Help. There, I expanded it out. And now I can see it. This is the key thing that I was trying to demonstrate. 
a page fault came in. This is spin lock time, whereas before we were looking at sleep lock time. Tried to allocate pages, ran into some sort of compact zone to compress the kernel, isolate pages, and spending all this time in a raw spin lock IRQ. When I see that at the top of the list, I think that is an allocation time. But I can't prove that without getting into the calling sequence, the call stack, the butterfly report to see this happen. So if I go back to my, I am 100% system time. You get out of here. PS-E, ref for memhog, WC-L. I've got 38 memhogs trying to run on a 32 CPU system, but really in reality, if I do a topology, I've only got two nodes or four sockets, two blades or four sockets really. Let me do a CPU map. So I got four sockets on this system. Once I get past four of these memhogs, they're going to start contending on the lock for that particular node. And that's what all that system time is, waiting for it to stabilize. 100% system time, all stuck in that uh, memory allocation area. Let me kill all memhog. Before I do that, PS-EF. So that's doing 20 gig. So as you get more and more threads, more and more sockets, more and more cores, you're just going to start having contention on memory allocation, and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. There, they're all terminated. Let me do a kill. Let me do a BC free dash uh, F, see if that can trim my slab down. All my system time went away. Again, I do still have unattached shared memory segments. I'm doing that on purpose to make it easier to get to the memory leak. How big is my slab, by the way? IPCS can use all of memory. So I've got less than a gig in my slab and it's slowly being uh, trimmed down. You'll be able to see that here as well. Let's get rid of the uh, non-pages. Let's get rid of cache. Let's get rid of mem free. So I'm less than a gig trying to trim it down. Notice it's still trying to grow because there's a find. So I'm trimming and then find is growing it and then I'm doing a trim and then I'm getting a grow again. What was the black by the way? Black was the page tables. Okay, now I want to try this again. Let me do a memhog, 20 gig. And I'm really not pinning them carefully, but let's just see what happens here. So I'm just firing off six of them. So I can see the memory growth occurring. There's the growth there, back to here. And there's the system time for the allocations going on. Those things are all stuck in the kernel allocating memory at this point. Perf top for that system time. So there's that raw spin lock IRQ and the isolate three pages. Okay, PS-E, rep for memhog. Let's just 
try an S trace dash P on three five four seven. Now you can see there's no system call going on, it's pure allocation. Now we can't really see trims or anything like that happening right now. I wanted to look at get delays, but I can't right now. Kill all memhog. All dead. Let's see if I can just run one of these. A little bit of system time in there, but it's mostly user time. There's the growth going on right there in and on pages. And then it's finished. Now, did I have CSA accounting turned on on this thing? CSA com dash n memhog tail. So that particular run only took 16 seconds. Now let's try two of them. You follow me? I want to create contention now. Do three of them. I want to do a D look dash summary on 3559, just picking one of them. Oops, I don't have DLOOK summary on this system yet. Uh, copy slash home guest bin DLOOK dash summary slash root slash bin. So those memhogs, I ran three of them. So you say com dash n. Memhog. So when I only ran one, it was 16 seconds. When I ran three of them, it's 20 to 22 seconds. Let's up the size of this now. Now I've got five of them running. Let's do a D look dash summary on 3567. And it's got all of its pages spread across nodes 0 and 1. Now, at this point, I am going to try, let's see, did I have it here? It's convenient to have the CPU set dash Q, even if you're not using CPU sets, since uh, the global CPU sets still exist, too. Are these things still running? So i got six of them running right now. Let me grab a copy of them now, CPU set dash Q dash V into slash temp slash X. Now I'll do a DLOOK summary on each of them. I'm going to go back to slides here in a minute. Bring up top. Those memhogs that were 20 gig are still running. Notice I have high system time between them. Personally, I think this is a bug. There's something going on here where I would normally not have this much system time. Perf, top dash G. Let's just see if that does anything for me. So there's that raw spin lock IRQ. Let me do a top sys. Now you can see those mem hogs are still up at the top of the list. Ninety some percent of that time is system time. I was doing a perf top dash G. Let me do it again. Oops. Now let's see if I can do a perf report. 
dash G. And there we are with that raw spin lock IRQ time. I'm waiting to see if it expanded it. Let me try a question mark here. Zoom in, zoom out, collapse all call chains, expand all call chains, E. So let me try an E here. And I don't know why it's taking a while to expand this right now or whether I did something wrong in my case. But I'm not getting an expansion on that thing. There we are. So here now I can see all that system time due to this memhog page fault coming in and all my spin lock time. So I have contention on the spin lock that is called out of this isolate migrate pages, which is part of the allocation thread. See if these things are still running. We were in the 20 second range. These things are already in the minutes. And all I did was run uh, six of them. Those migration threads are kicking in. You okay with what I'm doing? 15% yeah. system time, even though it's small, these programs, my interactive response is good, but these programs are having trouble running. Let me just let them run for a while. I want to go back to the uh, presentation and wrap up. Any questions before we uh, return? So I never did get to the out-of-memory killer very easily, and I, I was not going to demonstrate overcommit. It's a waste of time. Don't do it. Now, programs react with no memory. In this case, I set my number of threads real, real huge, and I got a segmentation fault. One of the first things that a programmer should do when they get a segmentation fault, which is a signal 11, is... By the way, on IRIX, you would normally get a message in bar log messages saying we just killed something because it exceeded a stack limit. Compilers might even warn you that you're going to need to increase the stack limit. But then I did look at the stack limit here, which was real, real small, increased it, then it, then it ran successfully. Maximum process size, I still have five 16 terabyte regions, giving me 80 terabyte of user address space. Largest space that can be malloced is 16 terabyte, and 46 bit addressing that we have basically yields a 64 terabyte maximum size. And the shared memory limit, 256 gigabytes unless huge pages are used. So I was in the top, and the exercise is going to have you go into top. Virtual is what I reserved. RSS is RES is what's in memory physically. How much of it is shared? Percentage of memory being used. And remember, swap. Swap is not swap. It is uh, virtual minus the RES. I like to call it slop. So I could have a situation where all my memory or my swap is zero, no swap configured, and I malloc uh, malloc uh, 16 terabyte and only use one terabyte. The other 15 terabyte might still be in memory, not out on swap, but it would still show up in the swap field. So I like to call that swap field slop, meaning that I'm reserving a lot more than I really need. Then I got the size of the coda, size of the data, size. End fault again are major page faults, and even if you don't have a swap and are not swapping, an end fault could be going out to get the executable, which means I'm trimming the cache, throwing away the executable, and then reading it back in. So I can get into a thrash situation between those two. And the lab exercise also then has using PS personality. So here I can get both the virtual size and the physical size. 
I always thought it strange PS-L only gives me the virtual, which is irrelevant since we can oversubscribe. And then I have a long-standing RP that, or PV that they rejected. When I'm in IRIX mode, I wanted to be in the units that IRIX has, but there are pages on one side and megabytes in the other, and they would not change the format. And again, the RSS is all we really care about. PS-O, to use different options on it to get the command name, things of that sort. Page false is known as page ends. So I did a PS-O to show these different codes and the different fields. Some of them are null, depending upon the syntax and the OS flavor that you're running. There is a memac RSS command that comes with the memac command that will show you what the true RSS is for multi-threading and MPI and shared memory space between them. Node info, we use that in the NUMA tools area. Again, I have a version out there that includes the Shamem. We want to be able to track that as well. I could suck up all the memory on a socket, go away, just write a file in dev Shamem, and then somebody else comes onto that socket and doesn't know there's no memory available. Hits are preferred, but again, these are just on allocations. Just because I allocated on a node doesn't mean the thread that goes to that allocated area and processes it is running on the same socket. A miss says that somebody came into me. Foreign says I had to go somewhere else to allocate. And NUMA CTL in the library interface does have an interleave policy. D look showing me each individual page. But again, there's a DLOOK summary that I'm using to give me total number of pages per socket or per node, I mean. Mentioned this earlier, PMAP showing me what the actual libraries are that it's running, what it actually did load. Also, PROC PID status is where I was going for things like the affinity information. And we also have memory usage. Then there's also a proc PID stat file. Now this is a useful page underneath in the notes. I have documented each one of these fields and what they are. Then there's also a cat stat M file that has the size, the residence, the shared, the text, library size, data size, and then the last field is zero. Now PMAP is getting its data from cat maps. The format of this has changed. PMAP was broken for a while in SLES 11 SP2. And here's what I was trying to do earlier. I was trying to do an S trace on code 403, which is a malloc. And we could actually see it doing a break for each individual malloc. Now, the code 4 that I had was inefficient with mallocing like one byte at a time. And then we rewrote it. There's a code for new somewhere out there that it will actually do it in bigger chunks and malloc the data in bigger chunks so that I don't thrash on the break system call. Now, page allocation, buffer cache and file I.O. is first touch. Let's see. If, if these are one, then it's round robin. My syntax, my spelling is kind of wrong here. Spread page, if that's a zero, says we're not going to be spread page, which would give me a first touch. Date is first touch on the node doing the reference. This is, again, meant to reduce latency. The cache and slab free memory is not node aware if you're using dplace only. If you're node aware, you're in CPU sets and NUMA CTL. Multi-threaded applications, you want to decompose the array so it fits on the node. This is what I was just trying to look at. Each node is single-threaded. And also, you do have for memory resident file systems a memory policy capability. So for example, I have a large shemem just sitting there unattached. And if that's creating me problems, I can make my dev shemem a interleave, which would be bad for the interconnect and bad for latency, but good for the next program that comes along and tries to use the memory. Again, zero out the array in a uh, NUMA aware situation and solve your cache problems first. 
Now, there is something called huge pages that can go up to 256 megabyte. Uh, you might have to increase the number of huge page sizes that you can get. This is hopefully going to reduce TLB misses depending upon your stride, but fix your stride first. And then we can look at TLB misses with these tools to be sure. So there's an example in the lab where you're running matrix A, matrix B, and then we'll look at the TLB misses. I'm not going to demonstrate that right now. Now, huge pages can get into a fragmentation situation. There's no garbage collection. And SysCTL does have a uh, NR huge pages. There's two ways of getting to huge pages, either through a MemMap or ShaMem. MemRap is a for a memory resident file system, so we can mount a huge TLB, and it'll be a type huge TLB. Now, I do have an exercise if you wanted to play with this, and two programs, one that we'll do by ShaMem and the other one that we'll do by MMAP. And uh, meminfo and node info do give huge page information. So there are some examples out there. Requires recoding the application. Basically with shem get, I can say put it in shemem, or when I memory map, I can open the file in a particular file system that is a huge TLB file system. And then when I mem map, I get larger page sizes. So our default page size is 4K. Uh, they are mapped into 16 meg within the hub. Huge pages, 2 meg, and with huge pages, we can get to 8 gig. And then when we go to super pages, and I think this is still accurate, only one page and one size allowed. I'm not sure about this lately. One terabyte is what I had here, but this stuff changes. You're limited to the size of a node. So that's usually like 64 gig or something like that. And there is the ability for larger DIMMs and future OS enhancements. Super pages are SGI specific. It's a permanent reservation. You can't move it between the BIOS and the OS. So super pages are meant to be reducing TOB misses. Huge pages only go to 256 meg. We can get up into the gig. No applications are using it that I know of, but MPT and UPC do support it. And if you want to rewrite your application, there's a library interface to basically mmap and unmap it. So you need some RPMs loaded, just showing the different RPMs at the time. You then configure the superpages.com to define the allocation that you want. And then there's a super page that's defined to HW that sets it into PROM. And then you reboot to pick up the PROM settings. And I think it would be worthwhile for you to practice this when you get a chance, since you mentioned you're going to use it with your MPT. These settings persist across reboots. There is a, at the uh, EFI level, there's an EFI V command to print out if you have super pages defined, and then you can delete that. You might not be able to boot your system if super pages are configured wrong. And there is a super pages test command to make sure that super pages are working. So basically, the superpages.com, you've got some sort of page size that you can configure. Again, the super pages defined will do it all for you. And you get basically a tag, the size of the page, and start information. So procedure, super pages underscore define dash capital L will tell you what you can do. And then I had a 64 gig machine, so I defined my super pages as 64 gig. Then I did a, uh, I, in this case, I did an echo of it into superpages.com, checked it with super page define dash L, and then I rebooted. At the EFI, I checked to see the define was there. Also, during D message, I can grep to see if super page zero got defined, and there should be a super pages kernel module loaded, and then I can you test it with the super pages command. So there is a lab procedure for you to try that. There are no man pages yet that I know of, but super pages defined dash H will show you what you can do. Uh, for example, super pages dash W parses the superpages.com and writes it into the BIOS. 
Uh, what else did we have? List these super pages you can, are available. You can delete the super page to find, get rid of it, and then reboot. Uh, what else is there? You can modify it on a per node basis. Anyway, so I did the super pages to Vine-L, nothing found. I catted my superpages.com for an example. I did the super pages to find and then listed it and then rebooted. Looks like I have another example. So I did a dash L, said I want four gig super pages here. Then I wrote that into the BIOS. Then I basically verified that superpages.conf was successful. The find showed that I have this tag super page zero and then I rebooted and on reboot from the CMC prompt, I did an if I var to see it. And then I ran the super pages command after I rebooted. Looks like I have redundancy here with the super pages syntax versus super pages defined. There's no flavor here to say run it without super pages. So I can't really benchmark or compare a difference here. Moving on. When we are doing malloc's, malloc's can fail. There is a malloc check capability as an environment variable for GCC to look for uh, heap corruption and things of that sort, or abort on corruption. Detect simple errors such as one byte overruns or multiple free calls. There's also something called electric fence. Invalid reads and writes. I do have an example out there. Basically, it was kind of like this over indexing blank common where I create a big BSS space and then try to index into it. This electric fence will place invalid pages before and after any allocated block and if they get allocated or referenced then there's going to be an error. And you have to link in the eFence library when you run this thing. There is Valgrind. I haven't been using that in years. Again, I'm wrapping up, but a summary, a process has a reservation and then an allocation. A process has data, text, data, and a stack, maybe a mapped in a shared segment. PS and top have special options to look at memory. Program dies if not enough virtual memory for allocation. And kernel may kill processes on a memory shortage hitting the OOM. So in lab, there's a program where you're going to monitor minor and major page faults. There's a copy and write where you will follow a program through the forks and then the allocation. Read the procedure carefully because it's going to stop and wait for a carriage return before you move on to the next phase of the program. So the stop points or pause points in the program are waiting for a carriage return to proceed to the next one. Monitor reservation versus allocation in meminfo monitor with top and PS. And there is a matrix A, matrix B where I want you to run with perf and PS run and look at TLB misses. Uh, a few things to look at the virtual memory growth when you're doing multi-threading and adjust your memory limits with the limit command. Check to see if you have any swap IO going on with SAR dash big W. Try to create an out of memory event I usually drop the swap and suck up all my memory with a dev shemem file to make it easier to hit boom. There's a huge pages lab and there's a super pages lab. So with that, I'm just going to call it a day and end any uh, WebEx session here. <laughs>